APCAM this year is a virtual meeting being held online. And hopefully next year, it will be safe enough for us to all get together and have a physical meeting. Since its founding in 2001, 2002, APCAN's mission has been to bring together researchers from various theoretical perspectives to present focused research on auditory cognition, perception, and orally guided action. APCAM is a unique meeting in that it contains a wide mixture of basic and applied research from different theoretical perspectives and addresses numerous types of auditory stimuli, including speech, music, and environmental sounds. The fact that ABCAM continues to flourish is a testament to the openness of the attendees to considering multiple perspectives, which as we know is a principal characteristic of scientific progress. Now, I'd like to note that ABCAM is associated with the journal Auditory Perception and Cognition, or APNC for short which features both traditional and open access publication options. Presentations at APCAM are considered for a special issue of APNC. And if you did not indicate a preference to be considered for the special issue when you submitted your abstract to APCAM, you can contact the editors of APNC, Michael Hall and Mike Russell, to ask for such consideration. In addition, we would encourage you to submit your other work on auditory science to APNC. ABCAM is also affiliated with the Auditory Perception and Cognition Society, or APCS for short. This nonprofit foundation is charged with furthering research on all aspects of audition. The $30 registration fee for ABCAM provides a one-year uh, one membership to APCS, which includes an individual subscription to APNC and reduced open access rates for APNC. As an affiliate meeting of the 61st Annual Meeting of the Psychonomic Society, ADCAM is indebted to the Psychonomic Society for material support, and we acknowledge and are grateful for their support. And we ask that you pass along your appreciation to the Psychonomic Society for their support of ADCAM. Now, I should note that ADCAM would not be possible without the work of many individuals, including those on the organizing committee and other stakeholders related to APCS and APNC, and we acknowledge and appreciate all their efforts. Even so, I would like to explicitly acknowledge two individuals who have contributed significantly to the organization and implementation of this year's ADCAM. The first is my co-chair, Laura Getz. Laura developed the Google Docs forms, which we use for abstract submission, handle many queries regarding various aspects of the meeting, and prepared the program book for the posting on the web. The second is Jake Patton, who along with Laura figured out all the details of Zoom, and how we could actually pull this off. And it's also coordinating many of the Zoom tasks today. Finally, I have just a couple of points to help you get the most out of the talks. First, talks will be timed by using the chat box. So we ask speakers to monitor the chat as they give their presentation. Signals of the remaining time will indicate the time remaining in your session, including the question period. Second, if audience members have questions during the talk, we ask that you put those questions in the chat box. Okay. And then at the end of the talk, the chair or the speaker will uh, directly access those questions. All of the talks, including the keynote by Dr. Ed Golub, will be in this virtual room where we are now. However, the posters will all be in different rooms. More specifically, each poster presenter has his or her own Zoom room. And the Zoom link for each poster is in the program. Uh, the poster session will be from 11.30 to 1. For odd-numbered posters, we ask that the presenters be at their posters from 11.30 to 12.15. For even-numbered posters, we ask that the presenters be at their posters from 12.15 to 1 p.m. Okay. Now, in closing, I will note that we have talks and posters on a wide range of topics in auditory science today. And we believe that everyone will find something, and hopefully lots of somethings, to fit his or her interests. With that, I will end my opening remarks and we'll begin our first session on speech and language. And the first talk is by Karen uh, Bania and is entitled Rapid Perceptual Learning and Individual Differences in Speech Perception, the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. So Karen, take it away. Uh, so um, good morning, wherever you guys are and thank you the organizers. Um, and let me figure the pointer 
out here. Okay, how does that work? So I'm going to talk um, about perceptual learning, uh, which we define as an increase in the ability to extract information from the environment as a result of experience or practice, and which lasts on the scale of days um, and weeks. Uh, in other words, learning should persist over time. The problem is that while it's easy uh, to elicit learning in the lab, it is less clear um, how this type of perceptual learning can support speech perception in the wild. So the definition I've just presented implies that past learning should support future perception, but many studies show that learning is specific. So for this to work, past and future circumstances need to be quite similar. Now, in some cases, similarities might be a reasonable expectation. For example, Bory and colleagues studies learning of dysarthric speech and found transfer of learning across patients qualified as perceptually similar um, based on several features such as rate and intelligibility. But there is no guarantee the talkers who share one feature of interest, for example, an accent or speech rate, will also be perceived as similar on other dimensions. So past familiarity with rapid or accented speech of a small number of talkers is no guarantee for the future. So what does that mean for learning? One option is that learning serves a limited role in real life situations. We claim that there is another alternative that perceptual learning is a skill or a capacity that is subject to individual differences. And so listeners with good learning under one set of circumstances should be able to rapidly adjust to different auditory challenges using rapid online learning. Um, and if online learning su supports ongoing speech perception, then um, there are several hypotheses. One of them is that new acoustic challenges should yield rapid learning. This is something we already know from a big number of studies. Um, and more uh, relevant for the current talk is that rapid learning under one set of adverse conditions should be correlated with performance uh, under uh, independent adverse conditions. Um, and also sadly, learning is expected to be affected in groups with impaired perception. So the basic paradigm we use is like this. We assess learning using a time compressed speech task. So listeners uh, are asked to report highly compressed speech presented uh, in sentence format. Um, and to dissociate poor learning and poor perception, compressor levels are usually adjusted at the group level such that the distribution of initial recognition accuracy is kind of similar across the groups we study. Um, and then from, um, from these, this learning task, we extract the learning index, either a percent change or a slope. Um, and we also test speech recognition with different acoustic challenges in different sentences. And we know from previous studies that there is no transfer of learning between the conditions that uh, we use uh, with the number of sentences that we uh, use to elicit uh, learning. So first, uh, just to show you that this paradigm actually work as we would expect from the literature, then uh, we present uh, 10 time compressed sentences and we can see recognition accuracy uh, improving. Then people go home, they come back approximately a week later um, and we see that they have maintained uh, most um, of what they have um, learned in the past. And this is a very uh, brief sort of learning phase. It only lasts two to three minutes. Importantly for the current purpose, and I'm still talking about young normal listeners here, learning over the first 10, ten sentences quantified here as the uh, learning slope, um, it was quite variable across listeners and also accounted for unique variants in two independent speech tasks. One of them was recognition of natural fast speech, and we had two different talkers with two different speech rates, and the other was speech in noise. And this was true even after we accounted for hearing, initial time compressed speech recognition, um, vocabulary, and uh, working uh, memory sort of in a, in a mixed model. 
Um, so uh, learning on one task predicts um, how uh, well or how poorly people perform uh, on another task. So rapid perceptual learning accounts for unique variance in naive untrained performance on independent speech assessments. And this is true across the groups we studied so far. So it seems that rapid learning could be another factor or a skill that supports speech recognition under adverse cognition. Looking at the full half of the glass here, this might explain how learning that is specific to the acoustic, um, that is specific to the acoustic condition which elicited it can still be useful. However, moving to the empty half of the glass, Mayan, a former student in our lab, compared rapid learning of time compressed speech across three groups of listeners after accounting for initial level of difficulty with compressed speech. Um, so she had young adults, older adults with normal hearing and older adults with age related hearing loss. And you can see here that uh, learning uh, was observed uh, in, uh, in all groups, however, However, Mayan found that learning was degraded in older adults, uh, regardless of their hearing status. So, um, and, and sadly, those are the groups which are known to have difficulties uh, with um, speech recognition across uh, um, different conditions, including natural fast speech. And this was also true for the participants uh, in this study. Like older adults, rapid learning was also reduced among non-native listeners, but I'm not going to go into the uh, details here and uh, feel free to ask me uh, over uh, coffee. Anyway, together, these findings are consistent with our hypothesis that learning should be degraded um, when assessed under the same conditions that lead to perceptual difficulties. So rapid learning is reduced in older adults and in non-native listeners. And this means that in a given period of time, these large populations will have less opportunity to adapt to the specific features of a challenging listening situations. Now we already know this to be true, um, but what we suggested that there might be another possible reason why, which is they, they don't learn as much. And to make things even worse, what we see in the lab is probably an underestimation because the real world is not as considerate of perceptual difficulties as we can be in the lab. Now here is where it gets ugly. Uh, we see um, here modeling outcomes uh, for natural fast speech recognition as a function of hearing, uh, cognitive functions, so vocabulary, working memory, and attention, speech perception, uh, and rapid learning in young adults and in uh, older uh, adults with age-related hearing loss. No surprise, in older adults with hearing loss, the contribution of sensory factors is larger um, than uh, in young uh, adults, and sort of this is a, this would be expected from either age or um, hearing loss. Um, however, the contribution of cognitive and language factor does not seem to increase as would be expected if these were to compensate for uh, for the uh, sensory uh, deficits. Uh, and sadly, also learning doesn't seem to support speech perception um, as much. So the odds ratio for older adults was. 1.2 compared with um, uh, more than 1.6 in um, young adults. Again, this might not be surprising given, um, um, given that, uh, that learning also declines with, um, uh, with hearing loss, uh, but nevertheless, um, the, the combination of factors here would suggest that um, there is sort of the, well, the playing field is not level here as you can um, probably um, you can probably uh, see, um, and learning doesn't help um, as much as uh, we would hope. So rapid learning continues to associate with speech perception, even age-related hearing loss, but hearing impaired older adults, uh, the magnitude of the positive effect is smaller than in normal hearing young adults. This even in good learners, the positive effect um, of rapid learning uh, is smaller relative to, uh, to the young um, group. Um, and so th this is kind of all the data that I wanted to share. 
Um, and of course, we have many uh, questions. The first, which we fully acknowledge, is what can we do to actually establish the causality here? Um, is it true uh, that we have, I mean, is it true for rapid learning on other tasks that we haven't uh, tried? Um, can rapid learning predict auditory rehabilitation outcomes? Um, and if so, what can we do to actually boost learning? Um, so thank you for listening. Um, and uh, if there is still time, I'm sorry, I just can't figure out where the chat here is right now. Uh, but if I still have time and there are any questions, then I'm happy to answer. Yes, we still have a few moments for some questions. So if there are any questions for uh, Karen, please ask. Okay, given that it might be, okay. It could lead to some interesting coordination problems if a lot of people unmute at once, but given that we're not seeing a lot in chat, okay, perhaps people can unmute. Oh, we do have one question in chat. Do you distinguish between learning and retention slash forgetting with age? Um, well, uh, what we do is that we actually, so into the regression models that I've shown here, that we use immediate learning. Um, and so we think that that's sort of an index of learning. However, there, um, I mean, in the past, uh, and it's not only our lab, but many other labs have, or not many, but some labs have indication that learning over time sort of accumulates less. Um, in older adults, and so that might be an issue of retention. Uh, but what we have, what I've shown today, is just the immediate learning. Okay. Okay. Good. And in case um, you should wish to follow up with the questioner, I, I will mention that that question came from Lori Heller. Uh, we have a question from uh, Michael Hall. When speaking of generalization relation to other tasks. Were there any acoustic similarities across stimuli in those tasks beyond them involving speech, of course? Uh, well, these were different sentences and different talkers. Uh, so obviously they were all in Hebrew. The sentences had um, the same grammatical structure, uh, but these were different talkers. And so in previous studies on time compressed speech, uh, we didn't see uh, that good of a generalization across different talkers when we replaced the sentences. Um, uh, but we haven't done any other acoustic comparisons across the stimuli. Okay, okay, good. We're about out of time. So if uh, the next speaker could go ahead and begin screen sharing. Um, I think screen sharing has been disabled for like non hosts. So Okay, Jake, did you hear that? You're the host, Tim. <laughs> oh, I'm the host. Okay. Okay, I'm trying to find you to turn that on and I am not finding you so I think that um, if you go to like down to screen share, there's like an option um, to allow um, like in little menu opens and you have to like hit a button to like allow um, anyone to screen share. Okay, okay yes. there we go. Okay, let's try that. Okay, good. Yep, that works. Well, going online is a learning process for everyone, <laughs> even those on the committee. So thank you for your indulgence with that. <laughs> no problem. And um, the next uh, presentation will be by Tony Smith, and she's talking about effects of altering speech rhythm on selective listening in multi-talker environments. So take it away. All right. So most of the hearing population is regularly tasked with having to understand speech in noisy environments. 
In normal times, anyway, many of our um, social interactions take place in busy, loud places like bars and restaurants, or just at the family dinner table with people talking over each other. But despite how frequently we need to understand speech and noise to navigate the social world, still isn't fully understood what factors play into our ability to do so. Uh, for example, individual differences in speech and noise abilities aren't fully explained by hearing thresholds, cognitive ability, or age. But one factor that might play a role in speech and noise perception is speech rhythm. Um, and this possibility can be understood from the perspective of dynamic attending theory. According to dynamic attending theory, there are peaks and troughs in attention over time, which cycle periodically. And these fluctuations in attention can be entrained by temporal regularities in the environment. So that peaks in attention come into alignment with um, the timing of relevant stimulus events, so that those events can be better perceived. And speech is one type of stimulus that exhibits temporal regularities, essentially a speech rhythm that can entrain attention. In this way, selective listening to target speech could be facilitated by entrainment to speech rhythm. And um, a recent study by McCauley and colleagues investigated this possibility with regard to speech and noise perception. Um, they used the speech and noise task called the coordinate response measure paradigm and manipulated the rhythm of either target or background speech with either two or six background talkers or a speech shaped noise background with the goal of determining the effects of rhythm irregularity on target speech recognition. And so to like understand this work as well as the current work that I'll be discussing in a few minutes, I'll just go through the coordinate response measure paradigm quickly for those of you who aren't familiar with it. Um, all sentences that participants here have the same form of ready, call sign, go to, color, number, now. And within each sentence appears one of eight call signs, such as Baron, Charlie, or Eagle, one of four colors, red, blue, green, or white, and one of seven numbers, um, one through eight, excluding seven to maintain the same number of syllables in every sentence. Participants hear multiple talkers and have to listen for the talker with the call sign Baron and report the color and number within that sentence. So if they hear ready Baron go to blue three now, they have to report blue and three. And any talkers in the background always have a different call sign distinguishing them from the target, as well as dif a different color and number. The key manipulation was to alter either the natural rhythm of target or background speech. And this is achieved by speeding up and slowing down different parts of the sentence to varying degrees. Um, the rhythm conditions ranged from unaltered natural speech to being highly rhythmically irregular. An important detail to note is that when presented in isolation, the rhythm alteration did not affect intelligibility. So even the highly altered um, sentences were easily understood. And the difference in the, the Sorry, uh, the different rhythm conditions are signified by M. Um, don't worry too much about what the exact number means. The important thing to note is that when M equals zero, um, speech is unaltered. And when M equals 0.75, the speech is highly um, rhythmically irregular. So uh, along the x-axis here, we have um, rhythm alteration, um, or increasing rhythm alteration of the speech. And on the y, we have performance. Um, based on the proportion of trials where participants reported both the correct color and the correct number. So as the target rhythm becomes increasingly irregular, um, performance gets worse. But in contrast, when the background rhythm becomes increasingly irregular, performance gets better. And this effect might even appear counterintuitive if you expected that the more weird or distinct the background rhythm was, the more distracting it would be. So we essentially have two effects here. The first is the target rhythm effect, where target recognition is reduced when target speech rhythm becomes increasingly irregular. And the second is the background rhythm effect, where target recognition is enhanced when the, ba when the rhythm of background speech becomes increasingly irregular. And these results favor a selective entrainment hypothesis, which can account for both target and background rhythm effects. The selective entrainment hypothesis would suggest that the target rhythm effect is due to a weakening of entrainment to the target speech as the speech rhythm is altered. 
and as for the background rhythm effect, the selective entrainment hypothesis would say that this is due to a reduction in the possibility that you're accidentally entraining to the background speech um, at the expense of entrainment to the target speech. The Macaulay et al. study leaves several open questions which the present study sought to address. The first overarching question is how general the target and background rhythm effects are. Uh, basically, do they appear in all background contexts or only some? The second question is whether the background and target rhythm effects occur when listeners are able to use other cues to segregate speech, which will be addressed in experiment one. And the final question is whether the background rhythm effect requires the background to be intelligible, and this will be addressed by experiment two. So experiment one manipulated the sex of a single background talker. Um, male and female voices typically have large fundamental frequency differences. And such fundamental frequency differences can provide a cue for the perceptual segregation of target and background talkers. As with the original study, experiment one used the CRM paradigm, but this time the um, male target talker was presented with one single equal volume background talker. Um, and this background talker was either the same or different sex. And in addition, speech shape noise was included in the background in order to equate difficulty um, for the task for both same and different sex um, backgrounds when the rhythm was unaltered. And um, this was done because recognizing target speech, uh, the target color and number with a different sex background talker would have been comparatively easy without the added noise. As well, rhythm was manipulated for either the target or background talker. We had 36 native English speaking participants with normal hearing and four between participants groups. And within each of these groups, either the target or a background rhythm was manipulated and the background talker was either the same or different sex. Um, participants listened for the talker with the call sign Baron and reported the color and number that came from that talker. There are 16 blocks of 40 trials where the level of rhythm alteration was fixed within a block. In addition, the phase of rhythm alteration was randomized from trial to trial so that different parts of each sentence were slowed down each time. So here we see the effect of target rhythm alteration on the proportion of correct responses with the same sex background condition in the solid black line and different sex can in the dashed line. And for both same and different sex backgrounds, we see that performance becomes worse with increasing uh, target rhythm alteration. When the background rhythm is altered, we see an increase in performance, but only for the same sex background condition. When the background is of a different sex than the target, um, performance is unaffected by changes in background rhythm. So these results, do provide support for the selective entrainment hypothesis given the replication of target and background rhythm effects, but it additionally shows that if listeners are able to segregate target from background speech, the background rhythm effect is eliminated. Moving on to experiment two, the background consisted of tone, the tone vocoded speech of a single talker. And this tone vocoding maintains the original rhythmic properties of speech while making it unintelligible. Um, and what that tone vocoded speech basically sounds like would be um, like the Charlie Brown adult speech. Um, so kind of like a wah, 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 where it has like the same uh, sort of rhythm of speech, but you can't really understand anything going on. <laughs> um, so we again used the CRM paradigm, um, this time with that tone vocoded background talker and rhythm was manipulated for either the target or background with the same four levels of rhythm alteration as before. We had 20 native English speakers with normal hearing participate and for each participant, either the target or background rhythm was manipulated. Um, yet again, participants listened to the talker with the call sign Baron and reported the color and number and the experiment had the same structure as experiment. the first experiment with 16 blocks of 40 trials, level of um, alteration fixed within a block and phase randomized from trial to trial. So here you could see the effects of target rhythm alteration in the dashed line and background rhythm alteration in the solid line. 
And once, once again, the target rhythm, as the target rhythm becomes increasingly irregular, um, the proportion of correct responses was reduced. However, we don't see an effect of background rhythm alteration on performance, similar to the different sex background from experiment one. From this second experiment, we again replicated the target rhythm effect, but this time with the tone vocoded background. But a background rhythm effect uh, was not found. And this suggests that the background rhythm effect depends on more than just the amplitude envelope, which carries the speech rhythm. And that selective entrainment might depend on the intelligibility of the background. And this is consistent with findings from Peely, Gross, and Davis, uh, who found that neural entrainment to speech is reduced when speech is less intelligible. Overall, it appears that selective entrainment to target speech rhythm is robust to different kinds of backgrounds, including same and different sex, single talker backgrounds, multi-talker backgrounds, speech shaped noise, and tone vocoded speech backgrounds. But inadvertent or competing entrainment to the rhythm of background speech depends on the pitch and intelligibility from the background talker. And to conclude, I'd like to thank my advisor, Devin McCauley, our collaborators, Gary Kidd and Yi Shen, and the uh, wonderful uh, members of the MSU TAP Lab, especially those who helped a lot in uh, data collection for this study. Okay, thank you. We uh, have time for a couple of questions. Okay, there is a uh, question from Carolyn Palmer. Does the shape volume of the vocal track matter for the same different talker sex effect? Um, so, hmm. I would imagine there are more than just like the fundamental frequency difference between same and different sex background talkers. Um, there Maybe there were some other cues that had to do with the quality of the sounds due to the um, shape of the vocal tract. Um, but uh, the main idea was that um, they were, eight, the different sex background talker was, um, different enough from the target that um, they would be easily perceptually segregated. Okay, and uh, Carolyn Palmer says, thank you for that. So we have time for one more question. Okay, there's a question from uh, Jessica Louise Slater. Given natural speech is not strictly periodic, what would the entrainment hypothesis predict if the manipulation was to make either the target or the background more regular, for example, more periodic? Yeah, so I believe I've read a um, paper at some point where um, people did a speech and noise experiment where they made the target like I speech like isochronous and it wasn't as intelligible in speech as the um, speech presented just with its natural, not strictly periodic rhythm. Um, so I don't, so I would, I'm, I would expect that performance would end up being worse for a strictly periodic speech um, that was like made to be artificially regular um, but I'm not sure, I mean, I'm not sure exactly how that would map onto the selective entrainment hypothesis specifically, um, because like entrainment can occur or, um, stimuli that aren't strictly periodic either. Okay, good. Uh, we're out of time now. Need to move on to the uh, next presentation. Uh, thank you, Tony. If you could stop your screen sharing and the next presenter start. Okay, good. Thank you. The, right. the next presentation will be by Lisa Rombaugh and Marie Pastama Novosova. My apologies if I mispronounce. And they will be presenting on invoicement illusions and joint speech. So whenever you're ready. So let me quickly also share my computer sound. There we go. Yes, we, we hear you. Yeah, yeah. I also need you to hear the sound of uh, of my computer. <laughs> All right. 
Hello everyone, my name is uh, Lisa Rombaut. Uh, I'm going to uh, talk to you a bit about enforcement illusions and uh, joint speech. Um, so in this study, um, we basically attempted to bring together um, phonetic research on vocal synchrony with the very distinct research domain of embodiment illusions. Um, so we try to uh, combine uh, knowledge from these uh, two fields to see uh, what new insights that can bring. So I hope I can give you some uh, inspiration from uh, maybe a very different uh, field that you might uh, not be uh, familiar with. So um, I'm going to talk about some elements out of two uh, much larger experiments that we uh, ran, but I'm going to focus on the uh, most important main findings, uh, particularly concerning the focal characteristics of uh, participants after the uh, experimental manipulation. Mm. So let's start uh, at the beginning. Uh, as you are probably uh, very well aware, the most common form of uh, joint speak speech is dialogue. Uh, where it is very well documented that um, people mutually affect each other's vocal behavior, uh, in both in content as in speech patterns, uh, but also vocal characteristics uh, such as pitch, uh, etc. Um, there's likely to be a general uh, mimicking uh, effect there. Uh, there's also other forms of joint speech, however, such as uh, choir singing or close shadowing. Um, in those circumstances, uh, there are very interesting and also sometimes different effects, uh, not only on focal behavior, but also on um, other aspects such as closeness and trust between people. Uh, however, there are quite a few inconsistencies between uh, different studies in whether people adapt their focal characteristics to each other or not. Uh, sometimes they even diverge. So what does embodiment have to do with all of that? Uh, perhaps you are already uh, familiar with the rubber hands illusion. Uh, we stroke a rubber hand at the same time as a real hand. The real hand is hidden behind the screen and you get this very strong sense that uh, the rubber hand is your own hands. Of course, you, as you see here, subject is shocked by the fork. Uh, and as you can see here in the video, he only pulls back his left hand. So it's not just uh, a, a shock reaction to suddenly the fork appearing. Uh, there's, there's really a strong feeling that the rubber hand is, uh, is his own hand, even though the subject rationally knows that this is not uh, actually the case. There's uh, many other types of uh, embodiment illusions, uh, full body illusion in virtual reality, enfacement where you're looking in a mirror, which is actually a video of someone else. Um, and they are all characterized by multisensory integration. You have touch and vision in the rubber hand illusion. You might have motor feedback and vision if you have a full body illusion in uh, virtual reality. Your brain sees the body move uh, while getting motor feedback from your own body that's moving in the same way. And your brain concludes that the body that you see is your own. And this shows us how flexible our body boundaries uh, are actually. Um, now, it's very important for this that the sensory signals that you're getting are both synchronous and simultaneous. So uh, they are the same and they also happen at the same time uh, or they will not linked, uh, be linked to each other. If the um, uh, stroking on the hand in the rubber hand solution is asynchronous, it doesn't work. Um, this can potentially be extended to our interactions with other people. So you see someone else move in the same way, your body boundaries uh, get fussy. Um, there's sort of a balance there between uh, empathy, uh, true embodiments, where we uh, really extend our body boundaries to another person, and of course also keeping body boundaries intact to be able to communicate with someone else as their own individual person. Uh, so phonetic research mainly focuses on uh, changes in prosodic features and pronunciation in the same lexical tokens, but uh, studies on embodiment consider this impact of simultaneous actions on the perception of the self other boundary. Um, so this is different from imitation studies or mimicking, but because it's about the identity of the speaker and not just affinity to uh, or in-group out-group. Uh, quite recently, there has been more uh, exploration uh, into embodiment illusions on the voice. Voice is sometimes called your auditory uh, face. It's very closely related to identity. 
Um, and of course, when you are speaking, as you are all very well aware, there are multiple feedback loops in place. You hear your own voice. Your brain is tracking your vocal muscles to correct slip ups. Um, and enforcement illusions uh, come in two flavors uh, related to that. So uh, very broadly, there is an enforcement illusion where you listen to a voice and you get fibrotactile feedback on your throat. Uh, we published some results on that uh, last year. And there is speaking while hearing someone else speak, where people um, relatively easily, more e easily than you would expect, confuse uh, self and other voice with each other. Um, the last one is, of course, very interesting because, because it's coming very close to what is happening in real life conversations uh, or rather specific circumstances such as choir singing um, and uh, embodiment illusions that are acting on the voice. I've called it envoicement, uh, may provide some insights into uh, these inconsistent findings regarding vocal adaptation. So what exactly can we learn from them? In our first experiment, we analyzed the vocal characteristics of uh, 96 participants who engaged in joint speech with a recorded voice. Um, they were randomly divided between, between four experimental conditions in a two by two design. Um, and here's where concepts from embodiment come in. We very explicitly separated simultaneous from alternating. So speaking at the same time or one person speaking first and then the other person and synchronous from asynchronous. So saying the same thing or saying something completely different. So the procedure was that um, the participants saw uh, sentences on the screen. They heard, uh, they heard a uh, recorded voice uh, saying those sentences and uh, they read the sentences aloud um, either synchronous, uh, simultaneous or asynchronous and alternating uh, in this uh, format of the four conditions that you can see here on the screen. So the goal of the experiment was to distinguish between uh, mutual adaptation that serves to su uh, support successful uh, interaction in an asynchronous and uh, alternating uh, speech, for instance, um, and divergence to prevent that blurring of self other boundaries in uh, simple simultaneous and synchronous speech. Our main result here uh, was an uh, interaction effect on uh, F0 with the strongest F0 adaptation uh, to the pre-recorded voice in the synchronous and alternating condition. So saying the same thing, um, but after each other. And there was actual F0 divergence on the simultaneous and synchronous condition where uh, people were speaking at the same time as the recorded voice and saying the same thing. So here we already saw that separating these concepts of simultaneousness, synchronicity, uh, give us some insights that would not have happened if we simply only compared um, synchronous and simultaneous to asynchronous and alternating. Um, but we wanted to see if we could replicate these results in a more natural setting, more closely to what a regular conversation would be like. Um, because of course, normally we don't get a script in the morning with what we are going to say in our dialogues during the day. So in the second experiment, we aim to replicate uh, it um, with uh, an actual dialogue simulation. Um, there were same uh, gender diets, uh, 66 participants who improvised speech together. And to do this, we adapted a, a theatrical game called the One Voice Expert. This is a game where two or more actors pretend to be one person and they improvise answers to questions, speaking as if they have one voice. Um, the trick is that no one should really take the lead and content choices are made by slowly creating sounds until a word is formed. I'll show you an example. Are you uh, Trevor? Yes, my name is Trevor Wilde. My name is Trevor Wilde and you must be Jen. Fermentation. Fermentation. That's right. Is that Dutch or Swedish? Swahili. It's 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 Jamaican. So of course these are experienced actors. They're doing it quite uh, fast. They're doing it for comedic effect as well. 
Um, and people who do it for the first time tend to speak very, very slowly, repeat the question, uh, give them some, some ramp up uh, to the point where they have to start improvising speech. Are you? Uh... So let's back up a little bit. Uh, what you saw was uh, pretty close to what we did in condition one in this overview. Um, in condition two, we asked them to improvise, uh, improvise different answers to questions at the same time. Condition three was them repeating each other. And condition four was improvising different answers, but one person goes first and then the other person. So the results show um, main effects of the uh, conditions uh, with synchronicity leading to a stronger F0 adaptation and simultaneousness to uh, divergence on secondary voice characteristics, more specifically um, F1, F2 and harmonic to noise ratio. Uh, so in exper experiment one, we found that synchronicity has uh, an opposite effect on F0 based on whether speech is uh, simultaneous or not. Um, but here we see a main effect of a slight increase in adaptation. Uh, we also start seeing some main effects on secondary focal characteristics uh, that did not surface in the first experiments. Mostly what I will very, very carefully call the suppression of adaptation or rather divergence. Uh, when the participants were speaking at the same time. Um, there might be a slightly higher cognitive load in this experiment due to the improvisation factor, of course, uh, might lead to uh, people diverging their voices more, uh, being able to distinguish between the two. So these findings uh, seem to conform our hypothesis that simultaneousness and synchronicity of speech influence vocal characteristics differently and uh, that vocal characteristics could be influenced in opposite ways based on whether people were saying more or less similar things and speaking more or less at the same time. Uh, a dialogue where the uh, people speak over each other a lot or one where they repeat the other's phrases with some regularity uh, can therefore then have different effects on vocal adaptation would be the theory. And secondly, uh, we'd also like to conclude that taking into account embodiment or envoicement illusion effects when studying joint speech can provide a new understanding of why interlocutors choose to adapt to each other in some but not other contexts. So uh, adapting on F0 or pitch to establish closeness and trust, yet diverging on secondary focal characteristics to keep the body boundaries intact so you maintain the conversation uh, as an interaction between two or more individuals. Um, if adaptation was just due to a mimicry effect, this suppression would arguably not be necessary. Uh, so I'm very interested in what possibilities you might see for envoicement illusion concepts uh, and whether it is even a useful framework or seems a useful framework for your own research uh, on auditory perception and cognition. So I'd love to have a chat about that. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you. We do have uh, time for maybe one, possibly two quick questions. Went a bit stressed in the middle there. It's the five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh no, so quick. But yeah, I, I have to luckily, apologize for that. I, I hit no the key problem. a bit early, so I, I'm sorry for any disruption on that one. I saw the, the 10 also, so. Okay. Um, okay, one. Uh, question from uh, Peter Ford Rusher. It seems that divergence of fundamental frequency could be used to avoid an envoicement illusion. Is this the appropriate interpretation? Yes, that is. that would be how I uh, would uh, interpret that. That's, uh, they, there is an attempt to um, not adapt too much uh, to make sure that you can still disting distinguish uh, your own identity as a voice uh, from the other. But I also think that we just started uh, with, with uh, yeah, exploring what exactly this means. So I'm a bit careful in that regard. Very good, thank you. Uh, we need to move to the next talk now. So if the next speaker could begin screen sharing, please. Hello, everyone. Uh, hello, I'm not seeing your screen yet. Okay. Oh, it, um, it's telling me that it's failed to start.
I'm not sure if it's because of permissions. Yeah, let's see. On this end, we have multiple participants can share simultaneously, so you should have permission from okay. here. Okay, good, good. We, we see it now. Okay, great. Okay, the uh, <clears throat> me. the next talk will be by Jaden Lee, and the title is The Effective Training Paradigm on Recognizing Voices Speaking a Foreign Language. So whenever you're ready, Jaden. Okay, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jaden Lee, and I am a PhD student at Boston University. Today, I'll be talking about talker identification, specifically in a foreign language, and comparing training conditions for learning foreign language voices. Studying talker identification is important for understanding speech perception, because the speech signal conveys both the communicative message and cues about the speaker's identity. Previous studies have shown that speech perception and voice identification are fundamentally intertwined, and it's been established that indexical variability affects speech processing. Phonological knowledge and language are also implicated in talker identification, such that the ability to identify talkers is impacted by whether or not the voice you hear is speaking a familiar language. For example, native English listeners are better at identifying English speaking voices, whereas native Mandarin listeners are better at identifying Mandarin speaking voices. This phenomenon is known as the language familiarity effect. Further, accurately identifying foreign language talkers has been shown to improve with more exposure to that language. For example, one study found differences between two groups of self-described English monolinguals, meaning that they can only speak English, but one group lived in Storrs, Connecticut and one in Montreal, uh, Canada, and they were tested in identifying voices in both English and French. The two groups were equally competent in identifying voices speaking English, but when it came to identifying voices speaking in French, the Canadians who had had lifelong exposure to French were much better than the Americans from stores who had no exposure to French. Uh, these were on both trained and novel sentences. These results suggest that just having exposure to foreign language voices, even without linguistic competence in that language, can lead to improvement in foreign language talker identification. So we wanted to test this hypothesis in the laboratory where we can actually control for listeners having knowledge of the foreign language and examine if systematic training improves accuracy in identifying Chinese talkers. We devised a four day training study for English speakers who had no prior knowledge of Mandarin to come into the lab each day for about 20 minutes and practice identifying Chinese voices. 89 participants were assigned to one of two groups, the same voices condition and the different voices condition. For the same voices condition, participants heard a group of five talkers each day speaking 10 unique Mandarin sentences with the same set of talkers for the first three days of training, but a completely new set of talkers for the fourth and final day. For the different voices condition, there was a different group of five talkers on every single day, amounting to a total of 20 voices heard over the whole study. The experiment consisted of a total of 150 trials of training and 50 trials of test. The training phase provided feedback after each trial while the phase, test phase did not. Here's an example of what participants saw on the computer screen while the stimuli were being played over headphones and they're asked to respond to the question on a keypad after hearing a single sentence on each trial. Just to give an example of what a group of ch five Chinese voices sounded like, I'll play each voice sequentially. So here is speaker one. Here's speaker two. Speaker three. 节假日不用门票. Speaker four. 节假日不用门票. And speaker five. 节假日不用门票. Now for the present trial, the participant would hear this sentence spoken by one of the talkers. 节假日不用门票. Which of the talkers do you think it was? Well, let's just say you chose talker number three, for example. Then you would see this screen after you respond. 
Uh, the next screen in the experiment will show if you got the answer incorrect and who the correct talker was instead. So for our statistical analysis, we applied a general linear mixed effects model with our dependent measure as the participant's accuracy in identifying talkers during the test phase. We used a treatment coded contrast with day one as the baseline and included training day as a main effect and participant and talker as random effects. Our results found the two conditions performed very differently. First, looking closely here at the data for the same voices condition, we see that day two test accuracy was significantly better than the baseline of day one's performance. Day three was also significantly better than day one. However, in day four, when a new set of voices was presented, performance dropped significantly from day three and went back to baseline. For the different voices condition, day two test accuracy was marginally worse than day one. Then day three performance got a little bit better, but was about the same line, same as the base, the baseline of day one. And day four was also about the same as baseline since they heard a new group of voices each of those days. Interestingly, the drop off in accuracy on day two in the different voices condition suggests that once new voices were presented on the second day, the participants did not retain anything they learned about Chinese voices from the first day. Then we applied the same model as before, but added training condition as another main effect, main effect. And modeling all the data together, we saw an interaction effect for days two and three. So test accuracy significantly differed on days two and three across the training type, but not on days one and four. We found no difference in performance accuracy on day four between the same voices and the different voices conditions. So taken together, our results show that there was no generalization of learning Chinese voices from the four days of training. Because even when training on the same voices for three days, the learning did not translate to a novel set of Chinese voices on the final day. Notably, the same kind of design of a four-day training experiment has been shown to be an efficient and sufficient amount of training for learning to be generalized on other auditory and perceptual learning tasks, such as identifying phonetic contrasts and adapting to a foreign accented speech. The lack of generalization to novel voices in this case suggests that the knowledge learned about foreign language talkers during training is only limited to that particular training set, which is not consistent with the hypothesis that mere exposure to the foreign language is sufficient for overall improved accuracy in identifying voices in that foreign language. And it raises a significant question of whether specific linguistic knowledge is necessary for a greater language familiarity effect to occur. All right, well, thank you all for listening. Uh, I would like to thank the following people from my lab who helped, well, if it shows, maybe not. <laughs> um, anyway, I can take any questions you may have. Yes, we have about five minutes remaining, so there's plenty of time for questions. Oh, we now see your acknowledgement slide. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, some, somehow very slow. <laughs> Okay, we don't appear to have, oh, oh we have a question from uh, Karen Benai. She says, uh, thanks for the nice talk. Do you think that four days is just not enough or that simple exposure yields no learning? Oh, thank you very much for that great question. Uh, so we looked into uh, the, the trajectory of learning as well over the, um, 
between the two conditions. And there was learning, um, and this is something that we just started looking into. Uh, and it doesn't seem that for the four days is not enough um, feels correct for this data because the uh, between the conditions, there was learning, but seemed to be a, you know, a plateauing um, for all of when it got to day three um, and day four for the different voices condition as well. So, uh, the you know, a very pertinent question to be asked about um, the conclusions drawn from the study uh, is that, is this enough to um, say much about exposure, um, especially when comparing to, you know, lifelong exposure for uh, foreign language voices, you know, from a previous study. And um, what I would say to that is that because this kind of training regimen is, has been seen to be sufficient for um, so many different other auditory and perceptual learning tasks and and as uh, also in a kind of comparable way in the vision literature of you know, identifying new voices, for example, we find it interesting that this was not enough for specifically uh, voices in a foreign language. So voices in the native language, it was enough um, in other studies, but voices in a foreign language um, was not enough to have any kind of significant uh, impact in the generalization of learning those voices in a foreign language. Okay, thank you. We, we have a few more uh, questions. Oh, uh, Hannah Schatzer says, interesting work. Did you find that there were any particular voices that were best or worse recognized from that final test session, uh, talkers 16 through 20, across either condition? And if so, any theories about what factors impacted ease of recognition for those voices? That's a great question. Uh, so one thing that we do, um, for voice identification studies is we do a pilot piloting study where we um, separate the voices into groups and um, see if there's any very significant diff uh, variance uh, between groups uh, for specific talkers, whether one stands out or as being very easily recognizable or very not recognizable. And what we were able to do is balance these voices and so that they would be about the same um, accuracy between uh, the talker groups for participants. Okay, good. A couple of questions from Laura Getz and Shannon Wright, both kind of uh, aim at the same theme about the relationship between the language. So does it matter that English and Mandarin are very different? And would you expect maybe better generalization for languages that are more closely related to the speaker's native language? That's a good question. Um, that, that is something that uh, we talk about a lot in this kind of um, work. So um, it's, it has been seen to be kind of true. Um, and the thing that we, we like to study Mandarin voices because of how different it is from English voices. So if we wanted to kind of maybe see on a spectrum, we could look at uh, all these other languages. But the, the great thing about Mandarin is that most people don't know it. <laughs> when we start getting participants in the study, so it's easy to control for, you know. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. And that actually feeds into a couple of questions uh, asked by Michael Hall and Jake Patton along the lines of could this uh, result in part reflect the nature of the task? It's not really requiring that listeners learn much besides being sensitive to acoustically similar or same things. Um, right. Uh, well, the the nature of the task is um, something that we have studied a lot in all different contexts, and for voice identification studies, um, that there, there's a lot of questions to be asked about the the specific parameters from each study. You know whether it's it's uh, the the acoustics of any particular talker group is you know. Um, severely impacted the results. But so many of these studies have been done um, in all these different contexts where we can see a regular uh, training regimen and a regular pattern that we all use for this kind of mm -hmm. um, question. Yeah. 
Okay, good. Thank you. And we're out of time now and need to move on to the next presentation. So thank you. And if thank the next speaker could begin uh, her screen sharing. And Jaden, if you could stop your screen sharing, please. Okay, good. Okay. The uh, next presentation is by Dana Bashard and Hameen Karawini. And again, my apologies if I mispronounce. And their talk is on bilinguals in challenging listening conditions. How challenging can it be? So go ahead. So hello, everyone. My name is Dana. I am a PhD student in the Department of Communication Sciences and Disorders at the University of Haifa. It's my honor to present to you my master's research supervised by Dr. Hanin Karawani entitled Bilinguals in Challenging Listening Conditions, How Challenging Can It Be? So how it all began, I am a bilingual speaker. My first language is Arabic and my second language is Hebrew. In our country, as Arabic Hebrew bilinguals, we mostly integrate into Arabic speaking schools where all materials are taught in Arabic. However, in universities, we have to deal with material learned in our second language. In my academic studies, I've, I felt that challenging listening environments, such as the noise of students talking around, influenced me to perceive and remember the material being taught. This feelings, right, this feelings right, raised my motivation to investigate how challenging listening conditions affect bilinguals, whether we are more affected by these conditions compared to monolinguals, and is the impact of these conditions greater when speech materials are delivered in our second language? And if so, what factors contribute to this? So I start looking for what is known regarding this question in the literature. I found that it is well known that challenging listening environment, specifically a noisy, noisy one, hampers speech perception and cognitive abilities. Also, previous studies have shown that bilingual speakers in their second language are more affected in such conditions compared to monolinguals. And their difficulties were attributed to imperfect knowledge and low proficiency of the second language. Thus, in contrast to monolinguals who have to struggle only with the challenging condition, bilingual speakers in their second language have to cope with the non-ideal condition and the imperfect knowledge of their second language. But, and although these studies have been informative, their, fo their focus was mainly on comparing monolinguals to bilinguals in their L2. So the extent to which bilingualism per se affect bilinguals in such condition is still unknown. Therefore, our first question in the current work focused in asking whether bilinguals would show the same pattern of performance also in their L1. In other words, we asked whether bilinguals would perform poorer in their first language compared to monolingual speakers. In addition, some previous studies have examined the effect of background noise among bilingual among bilingual speakers by looking into individual performance, which means by comparing bilinguals L1 versus L2. But inconsistent results were found in studies that included word level tasks. This arrays the assumption that the word level task may be not sensitive enough to reflect differences between bilinguals two languages. So the current study addressed also this question and aimed to uh, provide additional evidence for bilinguals performance in their two languages testing variety of tasks with different, with different complexity and contextual levels. In addition, in the current work, we examine the effect of two degraded listening conditions to assess whether the performance of bilinguals in adverse listening condition is specific to the type of the, of the degradation, or is there a shared mechanism that function across various of conditions? In order to test this, we examined performance in background of babel noise and in, and in a different kind of degradation, which is the vocoded speech. That affects the target stimulus in a different way, and I will explain. If we look at this spectrogram, we can see that a babel noise masks some of, some of the acoustic information of the utterance. However, vocoded speech is created by splitting the original uh, stimulus into distinct frequency bands, extracting and modulating each band amplitude to noise, and uh, recombining all frequency bands together. 
This manipulation produced speech that is low in spectral details and sound different from speech embedded in noise. Here is an example of original sentence and how it sounds in, uh, in the vocoded version. It was the women that complained when the old bingo hall was closed. Okay. So overall, this work was designed to compare performance of bilinguals and monolinguals in adverse listening conditions, focusing mainly in this comparison on bilinguals L1, examine differences in performance of bilinguals in their first and second languages on variety of tasks, and examine the relationship between performance in different types of degradations. The study sample included two groups of young adults, 30 monolingual Hebrew speakers and 30 Arabic Hebrew bilinguals. These participants performed multiple tasks, including recall of word lists and sentences with different a, a, a level of contextual cues. These tasks were presented in quiet and in the presence of, a, of Babel noise. In addition, Participants were presented with, one, with 20 vocoded sentences and their ability to perceive the sentences was tested. Here, I just want to explain how we analyzed the, the vocoded task and what it was based on. Because previous studies have shown that vocoded speech is hardly intelligible when listening to it for the first time, but this perception becomes easier following a short exposure. So also here, we tracked how the perception of vocoded speech, speech change or improved uh, throughout the task by comparing a performance in the first block of sentences given with those of the last block. The monolingual group underwent the three tasks only in their L1, and the bilingual group underwent this task in L1 and L2. So for our results, here we can see the mean scores achieved in word list and sentences uh, in each of the two uh, conditions, quiet versus noise, and the scores achieved throughout the vocoded task in the first block versus in the last block. I will start with the first question asked by which we compared monolinguals to bilinguals in L1. The monolingual group is represented in the figures by the black diamonds, and the bilingual group when tested in L1 is represented by the gray circles. So, as can be seen in the wordless and the sentences tasks, the two groups achieved similar performance in the, no, in the quiet condition, but noise had a greater impact on the bilingual group. This can be seen by their lower performance compared to monolingual in this condition. In this condition. However, in the vocoded task, and despite a similar uh, point of departure, bilinguals handled the vocoded distortion more efficiently throughout the task, showing greater learning process and more improvement compared to monolinguals. So what about bilinguals' performance in their second language? We can see their performance uh, by the uh, light gray squares in the figures. Also here, we can see that bilinguals achieved similar uh, scores in, in words and sentences presented in a uh, quiet in their two languages. However, an interesting finding was observed in the noise condition. Although noise had a similar effect on L1 and L2 in the wordless task and deteriorated the two languages to a similar extent, in the uh, sentences task, noise deteriorated more L2 performance compared to L1. In addition, uh, the bilingual participants uh, uh, in the vocoded task, task handled L2 vocoded stimuli less efficiently compared to L1. This is reflected by their initial uh, lower uh, initial scores and the limited learning process of this in this language. Also, we compared performance in low predictability sentences versus high predictability sentences to assess to which extent contextual cues affect performance. We found that the only situation in which participants did not derive significant benefit from contextual cues is when bilinguals were tested in a noise and the stimuli were given in their second language. We can see this in the enlarged figure by the similar scores achieved in low and high predictability sentences among bilinguals in their second language. 
And regarding our last question, significant and positive correlation were found between scores achieved in noise and throughout the vocoded task. These significant correlations were found among bilinguals in their two languages, but not among monolingual. And I will elaborate this later. But for now, the correlation found among bilinguals showed that bilingu bilinguals who achieved better performance in noise could handle more efficiently the vocoded stimuli. So I will conclude. Our findings showed that bilinguals suffered more in speech and noise compared to monolinguals, even when performance was native-like in quiet, and even when bilinguals are tested in their first language. These difficulties can be assumed to be a result of splitting lexical and phonetic inventory resources and exposure time among the monolingual speakers. However, an explanation of the different pattern of bilingualism in the vocoded task can be related to the fact that the, to the fact that the vocoded uh, speech served as a novel stimulus uh, that normal hearing bilinguals in our sample needed to decode and learn. So their better ability to cope with this novel distortion is consistent with previous findings, findings suggesting that bilingualism is associating with advant advantages uh, in learning of novel stimuli. Moreover, our finding by, findings by which adverse listening conditions deteriorated L2 performance more than L1 in sentences and vocoded tasks, but not in the wordless task, and that bilingual did not benefit from contextual cues in sentences presented in their second language, confirm the assumption that the difficulties of bilinguals in their second language are expressed in complex and contextual tasks. Finally, the correlation found between performance in noise and, and in the vocoded distortion points to a shared mechanism underlying performance in challenging conditions and can be explained by the ease of language understanding model, the ELU model, model of Fromberg. In brief, according to this model, when communication happens in non-ideal condition, in our case, when speech was presented in noise or in a vocoded way, a mismatch arisen between the degraded input and the long-term memory representations. And explicit process are engage, processes are engaged to compensate for this mismatch. Therefore, it seems that participants, actually bilingual participants who were able to engage explicit processes to compensate for the noise dis distortion, did the same with the vocoded a speech. We, sorry. Oh. We assume that this relationship was not observed among uh, among the man, uh, the monolingual group because noise had only oh, because noise had only a small effect on their performance. So perhaps that this participant did not have enough mismatch in noise as they had in the vocoded speech and their need to rely on explicit processes were, was different in the two degraded conditions. And now I want to express my special thanks to my supervisor Hanin Karawani for her, for her support insights uh, throughout the, the project and for APCAM members who gave me the golden opportunity to present this work today. Thank you very much for your listening and attention. Okay, and thank you. We do have time for a couple of questions. Uh, we have a question from uh, Mike Russell. Was testing in quiet and noise conditions counterbalanced for the different groups? Likewise, was L1 and L2 counterbalanced for the bilinguals? Well, are you... Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you now. You, you disappeared for a moment. Um, yeah, we here. do have a couple questions. Uh, yes. One of them from uh, Mike Russell, and he wanted to know if, if testing in quiet and noise conditions was counterbalanced across groups, and if L1 and L2 was counterbalanced uh, for bilinguals. Yes, yes, we counterbalance on the stim all the stimuli uh, in uh, the two languages and in uh, the two conditions, in the quiet versus in the noise, in the and the tasks. Okay, the good. And we also have a question from uh, Carolyn Palmer. She says, very interesting. Does musical training enhance bilinguals performance in this task as it can for monolinguals in related tasks? 
uh, we uh, we control this. Uh, all participants uh, were with no knowledge, uh, with uh, in any knowledge uh, in music, in music, uh, in music. So I I guess that music uh, training will enhance uh, uh, bilinguals maybe, but we did not include any per any participants uh, with the with the music uh, experience. So it's, it's an interesting question, but I don't, uh, in, in our sample, we did not include the uh, participants with the music experience. Okay, good. Uh, uh, there's a follow-up. Isn't that unusual to have so many with no musical experience? Yes, we, we use this criteria because the previous studies have shown that musical uh, experience may affect uh, performance uh, uh, unusual and uh, especially in the case of bilingualism. So in our case, we, uh, we prefer not to include uh, any participants with this, uh, uh, with this, uh, with the musical experience. Okay, thank you. Uh, that concludes our morning session on speech and language. We'll now take a 15 minute break and we will come back at 945. So let's thank all of our speakers and go get some coffee.